back to you then. Good evening. Here we are for some more micro. Chapter 25. Looking good for tonight. Let you know after stream. We'll do a stream test probably in a little bit here. After uh, chapter 25. Well, we shall see. But looking good for now. Get those uh, postcards together. And we'll see what else in a little bit. So, <laughs> looking pretty good for now. Let's just begin with micro. Since we did not get to it, uh, a couple of days ago, and we shall see from there. So, looking great. Let us begin. Stream test a little while later, but for now, pretty good spot. Fun stuff for it right here. So, let's see. All right, we've got the hell you will, Kalama snapped. Get out of here. He took off his glasses and polished them with a Kleenex, watching Dan Watanabe leave. The guy was quiet and smart, one of his best detectives. Those were the ones who created the worst trouble. The thing about trouble was that Ma Marty Kalama kind of enjoyed it. All right, that is where we left off. Let us pick it up from there. Let's see what we need as needed. Looking good for now, though. Okay, here we go. To chapter 25. Fern Gully, 30th of October, 7 a.m. Morning came, and the six survivors stirred inside a pocket of moss on the trunk of a tree somewhere on a rain-forested mountainside in the Koalu Pali. The birds were singing, slow and deep. They sounded like whales calling to one another in the deep sea. Peter Jansen stuck his head out of the hiding place in the moss on the side of the Ohio tree and looked around. He could see the remains of the fort on the ground below, trashed by the centipede. Nearby lay the dead centipede. Ants had already begun butchering it and had removed large portions of the carcass. They were near the bottom of a sea, Peter reflected. It was a sea of jungle as deep as any ocean. He cranked his neck, looking up along the tree's trunk. The tree was young and small, and its crown was ablaze with red blossoms, as if the tree had burst into flame. I think we should try to climb to the top, Peter said. Why? Rick asked. Peter looked at his watch. I'd like to get a view of the parking lot to make sure we're headed in the right direction and to watch what happens in the parking lot. Makes sense, Rick said. Peter and Rick pulled their heads in. The others sat huddled in the moss, with Amar between them wrapped in the silver blanket. He had finally fallen asleep. A bruise had developed on the side of his head, extending over his left temple. It might just be a bruise, or it might be a sign of the bends. In any case, they decided that Rick would remain with Amar to look after him, while the others would attempt to climb the tree. There were four radio headsets. All, t all, would all told. Okay. Rick would keep one radio, while the climbers would carry the others. Peter said, We should keep radio silence, except in an emergency. You think somebody from Nanajin could be listening? Karen said. The radio's ranges is only a hundred feet. The radio's range is only a hundred feet, but if Drake suspects we're alive, he may be listening for us. And he's capable of anything, Peter answered. They began climbing the tree. Peter led the way up the first pitch. He put on the belt with the reel and line attached to it and carried the rope ladder from the backpack. Karen King took along Rick Hutter's blowgun and the box of darts and the jar of cure air. Karen would serve as the expedition's hunter. Let me just get some water and pick it up right from there.
pretty good, good enough. Tree climbing proved to be extremely easy. Mosses and lit lichens, as well as the rough bark, offered plenty of handholds and footholds as they climbed. They were strong enough in the micro world to be able to hang from something with one hand, even by just a few fingers. And it didn't really matter if you fell. There was no real danger in a fall. You'd land on the ground unhurt. They took turns lead, lead climbing, one person secured by another with the reel and belt down below, would lead the way up the trunk carrying the rope ladder which he would then secure to the tree and drop down to the others to climb. The tree was covered with furrowed bark, and the bark was densely packed with mosses and liverworts, tiny plants, some of them almost microscopic in size, though to the microhumans, the mosses and liverworts seemed as big as shrubbery. The trees, the tree was also crusted with many kinds of lichens, frilly, lacy, and knobby. The leaves were rounded and leathery, and the branches snaked around. Eventually, Danny Minot gave up, gave up. I can't do this, he said, and sat down and tucked himself into a lump of lichen in a sunny, warm spot. We have to feature the stream animal. <sighs> you don't see her too often, so... There she is, funny puppy, the animal, real animal, it's funny, <laughs> pretty funny, fun with micro, and the postcard over there as well. Yesterday, finish some, most of them today. Just a couple more, I'm finishing off. Okay, where were we here? Lichens, tiny plants. Some of them almost microscopic in size, though to the micro humans, the mosses and liverworts seemed as big as shrubbery. The tree was also crusted with many kinds of lichens, frilly, lacy, and knobby. The leaves were rounded and leathery, and the branches snaked around. Eventually, Danny Minot gave up. I can't do this, he said, and sat down and tucked himself into a lump of lichen in a sunny, warm spot. Do you want to stay here while the rest of us go on? Peter asked. Actually, I'd prefer to be in the Algiers Coffee House in Harvard Square, drinking espresso and reading... Wit Jinstein. Danny grinned weakly. Peter handed him a radio headset. Call if you have an emergency. Okay. Peter put his hand on Danny's shoulder. Everything's got to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Obviously not. Danny tucked himself down into a frilly lichen. You can't just give up, Danny. Danny scowled and leaned back in the lichen and put on the radio headset. Testing, testing, he said into the radio. His voice crackled in their ears. Hey, radio silence, Peter warned him. Finn Drake, help, SOS, we're stuck in a tree, Danny shouted into his mic. Knock it off. I was only joking. Got a transmission. John Stone bent over the radio locator in the cockpit of the hexapod. Earphones on his head. He started laughing. Dumb bastards. They're calling Drake for help. His eyes moved upward. Searched the canopy. They're in a tree somewhere above us. Well, that was pretty stupid, but not the worst thing Danny's done so far. <laughs> Tellius grunted. A pair of binoculars hung around his neck. Tellius stood up with the binoculars and began searching through the crowns of trees all around, looking for motion, listening for voices. The spies were somewhere up there. They were not going to be easy to find. He couldn't see anything. Then he silently pointed with one finger. Go this way. 
John Stone toggled the joystick. The hexapod responded by walking swiftly and smoothly across the forest floor, making almost no sound, only a faint whine coming from the motors on the legs. Tellius was pointing to the base of a tree, a pandanus tree. Tellius pointed upward along the trunk. Up, he said. Johnstone operated a control, and claws of the vehicle's feet were withdrawn into sheaths, revealing soft pads covered with extremely fine bristles. They were nano bristles, the bristles similar to the pads on a gecko's feet could stick to virtually any surface, even glass. The hexapod began to walk straight up the trunk of the tree. Strapped into the cockpit, the two men hardly seemed to notice that the walker had gone vertical. They could barely feel gravity. Anyway, I'm going to get the tablet just for my peace of mind stream test and pick it up from there. One moment. Yeah, really just uh, it's better peace of mind to know that the stream broadcast is working without active chat. Of course, if chat was active, wouldn't worry about that, but I understand people busy on a hump day, you know how it goes. All right, let's take a look. Mm -hmm. And stream test. Chrome, refresh. All right, let's see how we're doing here. The three, two, one. Three, two, one. All right, beautiful, stable, and steady. As far as uh, <laughs> mobile streams go, let you know at the end of stream. The uh, plans for tonight, the uh, possibilities going forward for opening weekend and tonight specifically. So I'm not going to use too much battery, probably just the one chapter for now, just to be sure. Okay. Back to where we were. The climbers reached the top branches of the Ohio tree, and Karen King led the way up the final pitch. She, scr she crawled and walked along a high branch into a cluster of leaves that stood in bright sunlight, where she broke out into a magnificent view. The others followed her, and they ended up standing on a branch among the leaves. The branch swayed in the breeze. The Ohio blossoms, red and spray-like, resembled fireworks. The flowers consisted of a radiant explosion of red stamens, and they smelled impossibly sweet. The view from among the flowers took in the Manoa Valley and the surrounding mountain ridges. Around the valley, mountain flanks, cloaked in green and shared by cliffs, plunged down from ridges and defiles, veiled in clouds. Waterfalls threaded through rifts in the forested mountainsides. Tantalus Peak, the curving rim of a volcanic crater, looked down on the valley from the north. To the southwest, beyond the narrow mouth of the valley, the buildings of Honolulu rose, revealing how close to the city the valley was. Even so, the Nanogen headquarters on the far side of Pearl Harbor might just as well have been a million miles away. Actually, pretty warm sunny today, so let's go ahead... Pull over. Be a bit better. Okay. There we go. <laughs> it's a bit sweltering. 
Okay. Off to the southeast, they saw the greenhouse on the parking lot. A dirt expanse dotted with puddles of rainwater. The parking lot was empty and deserted. No sign of people or vehicles. At the narrow mouth of the valley, the access tunnel was visible, running through a cliff area. They could not see the security gate. The gate was closed. Peter took a compass reading on the parking lot. Parking lot is on a bearing of 170 degrees southeast, he said to the others as he peered at the compass. Then he looked at his watch. It was 9.30 in the morning. The shuttle truck wouldn't arrive until the afternoon, if indeed it did arrive. But right now the valley looked devoid of human activity. A thundering sound by a passed by overhead in the leaves. Instinctively, the humans ducked, grabbing at leaves and wedging themselves down. Peter went sprawling. Look out, he yelled. A butterfly zoomed past. Its wings, patterned with orange, gold, and black, made blooming sound, booming sounds as the creature whipped and twisted through sunlight. The insect seemed to be playing. Then it hovered, wings thundering, and landed on an Ohio flower. Droplets of nectar gleamed in the blossom. The butterfly unrolled its proboscis and sent it deep into the flower, until the tip touched a droplet. They heard sucking, squishing sounds as the butterfly pumped seemingly endless gallons of nectar into its stomach. Peter slowly raised his head. Karen was laughing. You should see yourself, Peter, frightened by a butterfly. It's, uh, impressive, Peter said sheepish, sheepish, sheepishly. <laughs> the species, Erica told him, was the Kame, Kame, <laughs> Kamehameha butterfly, native to Hawaii. It fed in the flower for a while, poking here and there while the wind carried a bitter stench to the humans. The butterfly might be lovely to look at, but it gave off a nasty smell. It's a chemical defense, Erica Mole said. Phenols, I think. The compounds are bitter enough to make a bird throw up. The butterfly ignored the humans. It took off from the flower and with powerful strokes caught the wind and soared outbound into the blue oceans of air. The butterfly had taught the humans a lesson. The flowers dripped with liquid sugar, just what they needed for energy. Karen King crawled into a flower head first. She reached a glob of nectar and began scooping it into her mouth with both hands. You guys have to try this. Her voice came out of the flower, muffled with stickiness. She could feel her body ramping up with energy almost as soon as she swallowed the nectar. The others crawled into flowers and drank as much nectar as possible. While they gorged on nectar, a movement in the distance caught Peter's eye. Somebody's coming, he said. They stopped drinking and watched as a vehicle approached in the distance, coming up the winding road from Honolulu. It was a black pickup truck. It followed the road along the cliff edge as it climbed and stopped at the gate in front of the, t the tunnel. Here, the driver got out. Peter, studying the scene with binoculars, saw the man take a yellow sign from the back of the pickup truck. The man placed the sign on the gate. He put up a sign. Peter said. What does it say? Karen asked. Peter shook his head. I can't see. Is it the shuttle truck? Hold on. The man drove the truck through the gate. It closed behind him. Moments later, the truck emerged from the tunnel and descended into the valley and stopped in the parking lot. The man got out. 
Peter studied the scene through the binoculars. I think it's the same man who dug up the supply stations. Muscular guy, wearing an Aloha shirt. There's a sign on the truck that says, Nanogen Security. That doesn't sound like the shuttle, Karen said. No. In the parking lot, the man walked around, scuffing at things, peering at the ground. Then he got down on his knees and stared, started running his hands back and forth under a clump of white ginger plants. He's searching the ground around the edge of the parking lot, Peter said. For us? Karen asked. Looks like it. That's not good. Now he's talking on a handheld radio to somebody. Uh-oh. What? He's looking straight at us. Karen scoffed. He can't see us. He's pointing toward us and talking on the radio. It's like he knows where we are. That's impossible, Karen said. Now the man went over to the back of the truck and lifted out a spray tank of some kind. He hoisted the tank on his shoulder on a strap and walked around the edge of the parking lot, spraying the vegetation. Then he sprayed the surface of the parking lot as well. What is that about? Erica asked. Poison, I bet, Karen said to her. They know we're alive. They guessed we'd try to hitch a ride on the shuttle, so they're nuking the parking lot. And I'm sure there's no shuttle now. They're trying to trap us in the valley. They're figuring we'll die here. Let's make them wrong, Peter said. Karen remained very skeptical. How? We'll revise our plan, said Peter. How? Karen asked. We'll go to Tantalus, Peter answered. Tantalus? That's insane, Peter. But why? Erica asked. Peter said, there's an antigen base up there. There could be people at the base. They might help us. You don't know. And Gerald Kinski talked about airplanes at Tantalus. He called them microplanes. Microplanes, Karen said. Well, I've seen a very small nanogen airplane, and you guys did too, remember? I found it in my brother's car. Amar and I magnified it. It had controls and a cockpit. Maybe we could steal some microplanes and fly. Karen stared at Peter. That's completely, totally crazy. You don't know anything about Tantalus Base. Well, at least they won't expect us at Tantalus, so we have the element of surprise. But look at the mountain, Karen said to Peter, sweeping her arm. Indeed, Tantalus Peak dominated the view upward. A hulk of a volcanic cone blanketed with near-vertical super jungle. It's 2,000 feet high, Peter, she paused and thought for a moment. For us, that's like climbing seven Mount Everests. But gravity won't slow us down, Peter answered calmly. He had taken out the binoculars and was sweeping across Tantalus. He found a massive boulder sitting in an open area on the lip of the crater. That could be the great boulder. The map says Tantalus Base is at the foot of it. He couldn't see the base, though. It would be only a few feet across, not visible from the dis this distance. He took out the compass and sighted a line on the boulder. It's on bearing of 330 degrees from here. Just follow the compass lines. It'll take weeks, Karen said. We have a couple more days tops before the bins hit us. Soldiers, Peter said to her, can walk 30 miles a day. Peter, we're not soldiers, Erica groaned. I suppose we could try, Karen said. But what about Amar? He can't walk. We'll carry him, Peter said. What are we going to do with Danny? He's a pain in the ass, Karen said. Danny is one of us. We'll take care of him, Peter said firmly. Just then, Peter's radio beeped and started crackling with a frantic voice. It was Danny calling. Speak of the devil, Karen murmured. Peter put on the headset and heard Danny Minot shouting, Help! Oh God! Help me! In the lower branches of the tree, tucked in a sunny spot, 
Danny Minot had fallen asleep. His mouth hung open, and he snored. He was exhausted after the longest and most terrifying night of his life. He didn't hear the clattering noise that approached him and hovered over him. As she helicoptered, hovering, her expressionless eyes studied him. She was a wasp. She landed and advanced carefully. Lightly, she touched his left arm with her antennae, then tapped her antennae over his throat, his cheeks, tasting his skin. The skin, so pale, so soft, reminded her of a caterpillar, a host. From the end of her abdomen hung a long tube, like a length of garden hose. The tube had a drill bit at the end of it. She took him gently in her forelegs and planted her drill bit in his shoulder. She thrust the bit into his flesh. It injected anesthetic. Then she activated the drill bit and drove the tube in deep. She began gasping, making sounds that eerily resembled a woman in childbirth. Danny was dreaming. The dream shifted. He was holding a beautiful girl in his arms. She was naked and gasping with arousal. <laughs> they kissed. He felt her tongue go down his throat. He looked up at her, and her eyes were compound eyes, bulging in a woman's face. She clutched him, wouldn't let go. He woke with a start. Ugh! He was staring into the eyes of a giant wasp. The wasp was holding him tight gripping her with her legs, and bearing her stinger in his shoulder, and he felt nothing. His arm had gone dead. No! He screamed and grabbed the stinger in both hands and tried to pull it out. But then the wasp pulled its stinger out of his shoulder anyway and let go of him and flew away. He rolled over on his back, clutching his arms. Ah! Hey! Help! The arm had become a nothingness hanging from his shoulder, a dead weight with no feeling in it, as if it had been pumped full of Novocaine. He noticed a small hole in his shirt, with dark wetness spreading in the cloth. Blood. He tore open his shirt and stared at a hole in his shoulder. It was as neat and round as a drill hole, and it oozed blood. There was no sensation of pain. Nothing. He clutched for the headset. Help! Oh, God! Help! He shouted. Daddy? Peter's voice came on. Something stung me. Oh, my God! What stung you? I can't feel it. It's dead. What's dead? My arm! It was so big! His voice ran up into whimpering terror. Rick Hutter's voice came on. What's happening? He was calling from the moss cave lower on the tree where he had stayed with Amar Singh. Danny's been stung, Peter said. Danny, stay where you are. I'm coming down to you. I fought it off. Good. Danny hunched up, not wanting to look at his shoulder. The blood oozed into his shirt. He felt his forehead. Did he have a fever? Was he getting delirious? He began muttering. No poison. I'm fine. No poison. No poison. No poison. Peter took the first aid kit with him. Descent was easy and quick. He let himself down hand over hand, sometimes hanging by one hand. He found Danny curled up in a fetal position, his face drained of color. His left arm seemed limp. I can't feel my arm. Danny whimpered. Peter pulled open Danny's shirt and inspected the wound on his shoulder. It was a small puncture wound. He cleaned it with an iodine swab, expecting Danny to feel a sting from the swab, but Danny felt nothing. Peter searched for signs of envenomation. He stared into Danny's eyes, looking for constriction or dilation of the pupils. His eyes seemed normal. He took Danny's pulse, 
noted his respiration, and looking for changes in skin color or mental state. Danny seemed very frightened. Peter inspected Danny's arm. The skin had a normal color, but the arm was limp. He pinched the arm. Did you feel that? Danny shook his head. Nausea? Or pain? He asked Danny. No poison. No poison. I don't think you've been envenomed. If there had been venom in the sting, then Danny would be extremely sick. With severe pain. Or even dead. But his vital signs remained stable. I think you're, you scared it away. What was it, anyway? A bee or a wasp, Danny muttered. I don't know. Wasps were much more common than bees. Hawaii probably had thousands of different kinds of wasps, many of them unnamed and unidentified. There was no telling what kind of wasp had stung Danny, if it had been a wasp at all. Peter opened a band-aid and placed it over the puncture in Danny's shoulder. Then he tore off the sleeve of his own shirt and turned it into a makeshift arm sling for Danny. He wondered how to get Danny down to the ground. Do you feel able to jump? No, maybe. It won't hurt us. Then Peter called on the radio to Karen King and Erica Mole. You are still at the top of the tree. Danny and I are going to jump to the ground. You might as well do the same. Karen and Erica leaned out from a cluster of leaves. They couldn't see the ground. Karen glanced at Erica, who nodded. We're cool. Karen, uh, Karen said on the radio, and she checked to, checked to make sure the blowgun was strapped tightly on her back. One, two, three. Erica jumped first, Karen following moments later. As she fell into space, Karen spread-eagled herself like a skydiver. She went into a glide. Wow, she shouted. She could see Erica falling below her, and Erica was shouting. They were gliding, and it was controllable. Karen moved her legs and arms and went off at a slant. She could feel the air flowing over her body, thick and soft, supporting her weight. This was like body surfing, except it was in air rather than water. She slammed into a branch and tumbled into space, unhurt, and spread her arms again and surfed the liquid wind, descending through the trees. She saw Erica diving at an angle below her. Erica had gotten ahead of her, was falling faster. Karen wanted to slow herself down. She rolled her body leftward and rightward, catching the air and using her arms and legs to slow her fall. Woo! she yelled. Leaves were coming. She had lost sight of Erica. She heard Erica scream. She burst through the leaves, and a spider web lay dead ahead. Erica was trapped in it, bouncing up and down, thrashing her arms and legs, trying to escape. A pale green spider clung to the edge of the web. A crab spider, very poisonous. Karen rolled her body sideways as she fell, her knowledge of the spider flashing through her mind. She needed to fall into the web. It was the only way to save Erica. Gotta hit the web. She had no fear. She could handle a crab spider. She slammed into the edge of the web and hung there, bouncing in midair. To Karen, the web seemed maybe 50 or 60 feet across, far bigger than a safety net in a circus. Unlike a safety net, the web was sticky, its radial threads spangled with droplets of glue. She felt the glue soaking into her clothes, pinning her to the web, while Erica plunged in a blind panic, screaming for help, trapped in threads out of Karen's reach. The crab spider seemed to hesitate. Possibly it didn't recognize the humans as prey, Karen thought. But it would attack, she thought, and soon. The attack would come in a rush. Hold still, she called to Erica. She rolled herself over until she was facing the spider and drew her machete. Yeah, she shouted at the spider. Her eyes moved rapidly over the web. She was looking for a trigger line, and she saw it. A thread running from one of the spider's feet across the spiral thread threads to the center. She flung herself across the web and cut the trigger line. The spider used the trigger line to sense the presence of prey in the web. Cutting the trigger line was like cutting a nerve. It also alarmed the spider. 
The spider suddenly fled, running away and tucking itself inside a curled-up leaf. It's home. Most of him scare easily, Karen said to Erica. She cut another thread and the two women fell free, while Karen called back to the spider. Sorry, sweetheart. They landed together on the ground amid a tangle of sticky silk. Erica was badly shaken. I thought I was going to die. Karen pulled threads of silk off her. Nothing to worry about as long as you know the structure of the web. But I'm a beetle person, Erica answered. Peter and Danny landed nearby, crashing into leaves. Finally, Rick appeared, lowering Amar with the help of the rope. They gathered in a group at the base of the Ohio tree, and Peter explained the change of plan. They would head for Tantalus. Ten minutes later, with Rick and Peter carrying Amar between them, they entered a fern forest, a seemingly endless maze of sword ferns, tall and dripping with moisture, arching from tunnels over that ran in all directions. Koa trees, Alapua trees, and white coquio hibiscus trees sprang from among the ferns, twisting into the upper story of the forest. Peter sided with the compass. That way, he said, and they began to walk down with a long, winding passageway among the ferns. Franz arched far overhead, covering the world in green. Danny was stumbling along when he stopped, stared at Amar Singh. Danny's eyes widened. He's, he's bleeding. Nobody had noticed. Rick lowered Amar, and Amar sank to his knees, while a rivulet of blood trickled out of one nostril and ran across his upper lip. The blood began falling to the ground in a steady drip. Leave me, Amar whispered. I have the bins. All right, that'll do it for chapter 25. Good place to leave off so I can take care of a couple other things uh, here before I head out to rehearsal. And as for that, I did get relative permission so far from a good few people, director, producer. Gotta ask the rest of the cast as long as there's no big objections. We are good to stream the dress rehearsal tonight. So very excited with for that. And we are looking good. So gotta get to the good dress rehearsal here for uh, opening weekend. Great to have that for the directors and such, so I'm very excited for that. We'll look forward to it, and we'll see about that. Yeah, we'll continue more uh, chapter 26, other things for uh, Micro here very soon, other good stuff to come. So we'll look forward to that. Good to see you for a good bit here, and I will see you tonight. Looking like, most likely, most probably, for Macbeth dress rehearsal. I'm going to charge my phone, so it's fully good to go for that. Going to leave about an hour from now, so get some other things ready. Looking good. Until then, look forward to it, guys. Hopefully I get a good perspective for you. will be great. Hope you enjoyed Micro Chapter 25, and see you tonight on this fine Wednesday, June 14, 2023, for Macbeth. Our uh, second to last rehearsal, or actually very last rehearsal before Invitational Dress and Opening Weekend, first of three weekends, so very exciting. It's going to work on the script a bit more. I'm feeling really, really good with that. Already got most of it down, just review more backstage. So until then, guys, see you tonight. Looking forward to it. Catch you then.